We thank you, God. Yes, Lord. If I can, if I can add any context, see some of the people that you hear continuing to worship. They continue to worship because they understand that even when I'm not the greatest version of myself, even even when my actions convey that I'm not being the best person that I can be, it doesn't change that I, my God is great. It does not minimize his greatness because of my imperfection. And so I'm just thankful. And then, and then there are other people that are crying out because they understand that when he could have killed me, he didn't. When I... When I deserved death, he withheld it from me. When I deserved calamity, he covered me. When I deserved to be embarrassed, he shielded me. Not because I'm great, but because we serve a great God. And so we thank you, Lord. See, if you anything like me, there's some skeletons in my closet, y'all. There's some skeletons that I'm hoping don't nobody let out. But if they, but if they let them out, I'm going to just say it is what it is. I can't. Because my imperfection doesn't change that we serve a perfect God. And so we thank you. God, we thank you for being great. We thank you for being better to us than we are to ourselves. Listen, kingdom, culture, God is. If you'll go with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12, I believe that there is a word from the Lord. Amen. 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting at verse 1. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. You'll be able to see it up on the screen. 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting at verse 1. The word says, then the Lord sent Nathan to David and he came to him and said to him, there were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup. And lay in his bosom, it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan. And Nathan said to David, you the man. He says, you are the man, thus says the Lord God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Thus is the reading of the scripture. I know it don't feel good, but it is good. Allow me to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity to share in your word right now. I ask that I would decrease and you would increase. Touch my mouth, place your words in it as you did with your prophet Jeremiah, that what is spoken in this place would bring glory to your name and edify this body, God, that they would not be 
compelled by the personality of the preacher, but that they would be compelled by the purpose and the principle of God's word. It's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you say, let's go to work? If you will, our scripture this morning features a conversation. It is a conversation between King David, who is the king of Israel, and Nathan, who is a court prophet and counselor. Now, it began because in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, the word of God says, and it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle. It happened in the spring of the year at a time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. Hold on. Rewind. It happened in the spring of the year at a time where kings go out. Now, I don't have any reason to believe that Joab is a king. It says he sent the servant and all of Israel. And don't get me wrong, they did their job. It says that they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. Well, y'all say, but David. One more time, but David. But David remained. At Jerusalem. So it was a time where kings go out to war. David decided to send his proxy instead. And instead of being out in war, David found himself at home. You ever been at home when you should not have been? Come on, somebody. Have you have you ever have you ever found yourself shucking off the responsibility that you actually have in order to be in the comfort of your zone? Yeah, so it, it happened that David remained at Jerusalem. So, so instead of being on the war path in battle, David is at home. And as a result of being at home, he finds himself witnessing what he shouldn't have been witnessing had he been at war. See, if he was at war, he wouldn't have been being a witness. But because he was not at war, he was witnessing when he should have been warring. He should have been warring, but he was witnessing. Some of y'all don't know this story and you're like, where are you going with it? <laughs> Stay with me. I just want you to understand the context. Context is David King should be at war in the spring, but he was at home. And because he was at home, he found himself witnessing some things. Now, if you know the story, you know that what he ended up witnessing is a woman by the name of Bathsheba. Y'all heard of David and Bathsheba. Bathsheba was doing her own business. She was bathing. David's walking on the roof, playing peeping Tom. <laughs> David ends up seeing this woman bathing. <laughs> and because, because he fixated, see what you have to understand if you look too long. I, I heard a preacher, I, I heard a preacher, fella, I heard a preacher once say it like this. He said, it's like basketball after three seconds in the key. Three seconds in the lane and you got to get out of there. If I can't, please don't spend no time in the lane. Listen to me. You know what you should be looking at and what you shouldn't be. You see a woman walk by, you don't need to know what the. I'm just trying to help you because what happens with David is that David found himself. He looked too long. You study long, you study wrong. So what happens to David is because like anything else, what it is that you expose yourself to regularly has a way of creeping into your mind. And now what was a thought becomes an idea. And then an idea becomes a desire. And so what ends up happening is David, because he has spent time at home when he should be at war, witnessing when he should be warring, has now allowed a test to turn into temptation. See, I need you to understand that it's just realistic. There is a part of you that desires to be everything that God called you to be. And it is at war with a part of you 
that will submit. Y'all remember low craving, high calling. And so there's a part of you that desires to submit to a low craving instead of reaching for a high calling. And so what David does by staying at home when he should be at war is he finds himself submitting to a low craving instead of a high calling. And so if you know the story, he begins to send people to inquire of her. And then the word of God says that he took her. If I can't explain that there are theologians that would describe what happened between David and Bathsheba, not as a consensual encounter, but as a forced one. See, one of the things that I've learned lately is that when there is a power dynamic that is unfair and unequal in a situation like Bathsheba was in, even if she desired to say no, because he was the king, it was dangerous for you to refuse a request of the king. And so what happens here is David inquires, he takes her, lays with her, impregnates her. Can I give you some more scripture so that you understand the backdrop of what it was that David did here, right? Is that in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. It's important to understand that as a result of their encounter, she ends up pregnant. And I don't know if you guys know, but pregnancy is a lie you can't tell. And so David understanding that there is a lie he cannot tell and that his sin is punishable by death. According to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, it says, if a man commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, both the man and the woman who have committed adultery must be. That means that Uriah, who is the husband to Bathsheba, who under the authority of the king has been sent off to war, when the king should be with him, finds himself being backdoored. And he has the right, according to the law, because David, although he was king, was not above the law. And so he could have very well had David stoned, Bathsheba stoned, that baby stoned, because the word said, the law was, if you did this thing, you can be killed. And so what happens is because David understands that his sin is punishable by death, he conspires to conceal the sin welcoming Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, back home. So he calls and sends for him to come home, and he expects that he will do what any man that is married would do when you've been off at war and in battle, and you've been around a bunch of brothers that smell like they've been at battle. <laughs> that you would crave the comfort of your wife, yet because of Uriah's integrity, because... Because of Uriah's integrity, which the king obviously underestimated, Uriah decided, not only am I not going to receive the comfort of my wife, I'm not going to receive the comfort of my home. The word of God says that he slept on the outside. He didn't even lay on the couch. He said, with my men out there in battle, there's no way that I should be here at home. And so he decided, not only will I not enjoy the comfort of my wife, I won't enjoy the comfort of my home. That if they're out in battle, I'm not going to be able to say that I was enjoying the good life while they were out there fighting for our country. And so Uriah opts not to. And so now David doesn't. He doesn't have something that he can pass it off. See, if he had enjoyed the company of his wife, then when the lie that you can't tell had come to fruition, he would have been able to say, ah, she got a husband. He was here too. But instead, Uriah doesn't. So now what David does is he sends him back into battle. But when he sends him back into battle this time, he sends him to the front line. 
And he doesn't just send him to the front line. He sends him to the front line, and then he sends a letter to the commander. And he says, listen, this is what I want you to do. When the battle gets its worst, when it's at the height, when the enemy is descending upon us, what I want you to do is I want you to pull back our forces. I want you to leave Uriah out there to make sure that he's killed by the enemy. Because there's a lie I can't tell. And so if he dies, then I don't have to worry that somebody's going to bring an accusation against me. And so it is on this backdrop and in this context that this conversation between Nathan and David is happening. And so these events displease God, who then led Nathan to speak to David. But I believe that there's a few things in the text that it teaches us. The first thing that I believe that the text teaches us and point number one is that you'll be tested at the top. I know. See, I need you guys to understand that often it is easy to follow the command of God in your struggle. But how faithful are you when you feel like you've arrived at the place that you've been pursuing? See, I need you to understand that many people will pledge their allegiance in need. But once it has been satisfied, often we forget about what it is that God is calling us to do, what God is telling us to do. I don't know if this sounds familiar to you, but have you ever been in a situation where things are going haywire, where you're worried about the outcome and you say that prayer that really don't mean nothing? Lord, if you just get me out of this this time. None of y'all, huh? I was the only one. Lord, if you, Lord, if you just get me out, if you, I promise, I promise you, I'm, I, I will not, I'm telling you, Lord, I will serve you all the days of my. And then if we are honest, the moment that God's mercy endures, we find ourselves in similar or the same situations over and over again. And so it's important for you to understand that you'll be tested at the top. The reality is God needs to know that he can trust you with the power, with the influence, with the purpose and the destiny. He needs to know that he can trust you with the gifting because the reality is when you're in pursuit, you feel like you need God. But when you arrive, you feel like you got it all together. I made it here on my own merit, boo. But also the enemy, the accuser, wants to prove to God that he wasted his time with you anyway. God, you've been you've been providing a safe hedge of protection around this person. And for what? Because at the end of the day, all they're going to do is something wrong with it anyway. And so you'll be tested at the top. Because there is a level of integrity that is necessary for the level of anointing that God intends to grant you. He doesn't need you to build influence so that you can create calamity. And so there has to be checking of the progress, of the performance. And so what happens here is David finds himself tested. At the top, um, I need you guys to also understand that the word of God declares in James 1 and 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. See, the reason that you're tested at the top is because God has more than you can imagine, but needs to be confident that you can handle the mantle, that your integrity can handle the elevation. And so the second point, Because as you will be tested at the top, you got to have somebody that can speak to the king in you and not the fool. That can speak to the queen in you and not the fool. And so if I can give you point number two, point number two is everyone needs a Nathan. In a time where we have decided that nobody can tell us anything. Who going to check me, boo? In a time where we've decided that we are the authority on all things, that we know it all. And don't. The moment that you say something to me, what do I do? 
point back at you. You talk to me about something I did wrong. You know, it's funny. It's funny that you got something to say about this when I know that you. Come on, somebody. Everyone needs a Nathan, but we don't want a Nathan. We want somebody to go along. We want a Joab. We want somebody that's going to aid and abed instead of address our mess. See, see, I, I love I love this. And, and I need you to understand, right? Every everyone needs a Nathan because as powerful as you are and as gifted as God made you and as much purpose as God has placed within you. Everyone needs a Nathan. See, Nathan represents a God ordained voice that can get through to you when you need it most. Everyone needs someone that can see you heading in a dangerous direction and call you on your stuff that can counsel you in your calling and encourage you to be your best. I love that in 2 Samuel chapter 12, 1, the word of God says, then the Lord sent Nathan to David. Caveat, if you will, join me next week. I'm going to talk to you about how it is that you know the difference between Nathan and Satan. Put it in your calendar to be here next week or you'll be confused, I promise you. But I need you guys to understand, right, that there's a difference. There's a Nathan and there's a Satan. And so it's important for you to understand that everybody needs a Nathan. It says, then the Lord sent Nathan to David. It didn't say that Nathan decided to go to David on his own accord. Brett, the king stayed a king. And so you have to be careful. If y'all remember in Esther, she said, even though I have something that might be compelling to say, I can't just find myself going in and talking to the king without there being an invitation. And so the fact that Nathan was led by God and came to David to give him something that was a challenge. Do you can you imagine what it felt like to be coming in there trying to tell the king that you've done wrong? But the word said that he was led to do it. Not by his visions. Not in his dreams. But by God. But it said that he came to him and he said there are two men in one city. One rich and the other poor. Can I tell you, one of the things that I love that confirmed that everyone needs a Nathan is that when Nathan comes to David, he doesn't overplay his position. Will you look at somebody and say, don't overplay it? When he comes to David, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't overplay his position. See, some people, when they have truth, they overplay their position. See, I believe that truth Without compassion, it's cruelty. And compassion without honesty is both delusion and manipulation. The challenge is when some people have the truth, they will overplay their position. They will decide that because it's what it's the truth, ain't it? I mean, where's the lie? Where's the love? Oh, that don't have to be in it. See, we are serving within a generation that has decided that exposure is more significant than leading people into repentance. And so the challenge is, does everyone need a Nathan? Absolutely. But you got to be careful. Everybody don't have the tools. What I love, what I love that happened here is I love that he doesn't overplay his position. To be a Nathan, you have to be able to balance truth and compassion at the same time. Nathan does not come across overly aggressive. He is not arrogant in his approach. Instead, he initiates an approach that was so smooth that it was disarming. Nathan uses something that is called a juridical parable. See, a juridical parable is a realistic story about a law violation that is intended to lead the listener to judge themselves. 
Will you say juridical? Parable. See, I need you to understand that through, through the story, the intent of a juridical parable was intended to allow self-conviction because you don't need my judgment. Nobody knows the truth about you like you do. Nobody is a bigger critic on your decisions than you are. Sometimes I get a bad rap. People say, you you be up there preaching about sin. You think I need to preach to you about sin? You don't know what sin is. You need me to beat you up with that. You don't need me to tell you to stop beating yourself up in the mirror about every bad decision you make. You need me to tell you, you know you a sinner, right? You know that's a sin, don't you? Uh, it's so disgusting. My God, how do you live with yourself? Given the... the reason I say that is because I believe that people that truly have a heart for God, sin sickens you even if it's your own sin. I'm not here to do the job of God. See, the Holy Spirit is who convicts. Ooh, I wish you would get it. The Holy Spirit will convict you. You know how many times I've given a sermon and I didn't say none of the words that it meant to you? When you tell me what the message meant to you, I didn't say none of those words. But because the Holy Spirit spoke something into you. You don't need me to give you a dissertation on sin. The Holy Spirit will convict you about your sin before anybody else does. And so what I love and how I know everyone needs to be, everybody needs a Nathan is because he gives him a juridical parable. He gave him a story that is intended to allow you to put a mirror in front of you. And because David, who the word of God says was a man after God's own heart, it didn't call him perfect. It said a man after God's own heart. And because he was a man after God's own heart, the idea of the sin that had been Spoken to him, made him angry, made him decide that somebody got to die for this. The man that did this, not only is he going to die, but he need to pay it back. Not just one time, not just two times, not three times what you took. I need four times what you took for this because this is trifling. And then Nathan got to break it to him. David, <laughs> hate to be the bearer of bad news, brother, uh, but that's you. How many times have you had a that's you moment? How? Come on, somebody. How many times has the Holy Spirit had to convict you that when you began opening your mouth, talking about somebody else's situation, and the Holy Spirit had to say, uh, 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 ah, ah, ah. Do you hear me? Holy Spirit had to slap the back of your neck. Wait, wait now, wait a minute. Because I know what I've helped you through. I don't know that we should be talking about this. I know it's easy, it's easy, it's easy because different people got different kinds of sin. And because of the kind of sin that they're indulging in, you'll be like, yeah, but uh, but what I do don't affect people like what they do, boo. The reality is a juridical parable was not intended to cast judgment on the party that had done wrong. It was to illuminate for them a principle that caused them to put a mirror in front of themselves and say, oh, my goodness gracious, you right. Oh, man. And when you read the story, when you get home, I need you to see what it is that David says. David says, I've sinned against God. He don't say, well, wait, well, 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 well hold on, though. I'm just walking. I'm going to be honest with you. I was just walking. She didn't have nowhere else that she could be bathing. I, I mean, I, I'm not. He does not make excuses. Because you have to understand that when you've done wrong, true repentance is to accept the fact that we've done wrong. It's the reason why. It's the reason why when I extend salvation to you, the first step is admitting. 
I have to admit that I've sinned before I can ask for a savior. I don't need saving if I ain't sinning. And so my admittance is the first step to my repentance. I have to acknowledge that I'm wrong. I have to acknowledge what is wrong within me and desire to have the Lord begin to fix it. Because without regard for what our contemporary approach to preaching is, God still requires and desires holiness from you. He does not desire for you to settle into your sin. He does not desire for you to settle into imperfection. He wants you to know it so that you can begin to ward it off. So that when those thoughts come in, that you can cast them down as vain imagination. But not for you to be like, I mean, you already know I'm a sin. You paid the cost for it. I might as well. That ain't the answer. So he gives them a juridical parable. One that is not intended to cast judgment and condemn, but one that is intended to illuminate the principle that there was a violation of the law so that there is a self-conviction that takes place. He puts a mirror up and says, imagine what has happened in this situation. And the moment, and here's the thing, juridical parables only work with people of God. Yeah. That means that if you don't have a heart for God, you don't have to worry. A juridical parable, woo! That passed you up. You're not going, uh-uh. You know, the two men and the man stole from the other man that didn't have no. That's rough. That's 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 terrible. Uh, anyway, how what you what you doing for lunch? And so the juridical parable only works for those that are the people of God, whose hearts are broken by sin, even if it is their own sin. So everyone. Will you say everyone needs a Nathan? I need you to understand, though, right, that um, David's given the juridical parable, but this is an approach that not everyone is mature enough to use because some people are so eager to expose other people. So, some people are too overjoyed to judge that their motive is not someone being moved to repent, but rather to make them feel the weight and the worthlessness and the sadness of their sin. So when you realize that the motivation is that you want the sin to weigh down on the person, you want them to feel bad about what they've done, as opposed to being moved to repentance, it means that you're not mature enough to be a Nathan. And so everyone needs a Nathan. Final point, though. Everyone can't be your Nathan. If you remember, if you were here last week, I told you God can use anything. But God doesn't use everything. God can use anyone, but God doesn't use everyone to be your Nathan. Can I help you right here? See, I need you to understand, and, I, and listen, this, will y'all say no shade? No shade. But these internet prophets and prophetess, I'm not mad at you that you got a little word and it's stirring up in your spirit. Sometimes that word is for you, not for. I ain't mad at nobody that is in a word getting a fresh revelation from the Lord. But the moment that you decide that you called. I'm not trying to get into next week, but I'm telling you, the moment that you decide that you're called to give correction but not have not been called to relationship. Ooh, it gets on my nerves. I'm not kidding you. When I see it, I'll be, I'll be mad, Brett. Do you hear me? Because there's so many impressionable, young converts. They don't know a lot. And you up there talking with a level of conviction and passion that makes them think that what you're saying is true. 
You got truth, but no compassion. And you don't even realize that you're being cruel to a new convert. They don't notice God like that. And they looking at you that's acting like you done studied. You got all your notes together and ain't a lick of love in the. God is love and he is truth is love and is truth. You telling me there ain't no balance. You know all the things that people are doing wrong, but none of the things that people are doing right. God can use anyone. But God does not use everyone to be your Nathan. And so I'm asking if you will, listen, if you will, I need you to come back next week because next week I want to dive into how you will be able to identify the Nathan that God led to you. Because our first scripture was, it said that God led Nathan. To, to, he sent Nathan to David. You've got to understand that everybody that claims that they got a fire and brimstone word. You talking about a whole bunch of general stuff that everybody knows. I know I ain't supposed to sin. I know I ain't supposed to have idols. I know I ain't supposed. Does that make sense? That ain't no first revelation. You got to be talking. I ain't trying to get mad. But you have to understand that when you have an anointing and a call of God on your life to shepherd people and you see somebody that is playing games with people. And not even playing games with you just to hurt you, but playing games with you to elevate themselves. Your Internet prophets and prophetess are looking to create a platform that at some point they begin to extract something from you. I say that to you so that you are prayerful about the voices that you listen to throughout the week. And I'm not going And I'm not going to leave it at your internet prophets and prophetess. Some of y'all listening to the wrong podcast too. Some of y'all listening to podcasts that are some of you are listening to podcasts that are intending to plant the wrong thought, the wrong spirit, and the wrong focus. And so you have to be careful to understand God can use anyone, but he will not use everyone to be your Nathan. Will you stand with me?